Hello YouTube! Now, today I'm gonna do something a little bit different. Instead of talking about computers like I always do, I'm gonna talk about math. And I'm gonna talk about art. How is this relevant to my channel? Well, we're gonna do art with math on a computer. It is the 8th of May 2013, a Wednesday. You're watching 0612 TV. <laughs> This is 0612TV. Welcome aboard. So let's jump right into the math. Now, if you've ever done anything that has to do with graphing, this will not be new to you. When you want to plot a graph, you have two axes. The x-axis and the y-axis. And then what you have is a coordinate, which has an x and a y value. The x value determines how much horizontal displacement there is. And of course, the y value determines the vertical displacement. This system is called the Cartesian Coordinate System. It is what we use in school all the time and I guess is pretty intuitive. So now let's say we want to plot a graph. Say y equals the x squared. So what happens when we try to plot a graph? Essentially, we have a running variable and a reacting variable. I'm pretty sure these are not, you know, official math terms. But, you know, just, just go with it. Here's the deal. Let's say I wanted to plot the graph from negative 10 to positive 10. What's going to happen is I'm going to set x to be negative 10 first. I put it through the equation and I get a value of y. Then I increase x, perhaps to negative 9. Once again, I get the value of y. So what's going to happen is in order to plot this curve, x is going to have to move smoothly from negative 10 to positive 10. y will react to the value of x and then using the two pieces of information, you will be able to find where it's referring to on a graph. What this means is x is the running variable, it's running from negative 10 to positive 10, and y is the reacting variable, which is of course reacting to the changes in x. I hope you haven't fallen asleep yet, because right now, we're actually going to move on to look at where things get interesting. What I'm talking about is the polar coordinate system. Instead of having x and y, we have r and theta. So that means instead of representing coordinates as horizontal displacement and vertical displacement, what we're going to do is we're going to represent it in the form of an angle and a distance. That's probably pretty hard to understand, so let's take a look at this example. Here, we have a set of axes. We have a point. Using the Cartesian coordinate system, we can say that this is however many x and however many y. Alternatively, we can say this is however many r and however many theta. So by representing points as an angle and a distance instead of, you know, two distances, we can also uniquely point out every single position within the Cartesian coordinate space. However, what is interesting then is that the running variable and reacting variable are completely different things. Since now, when we want to plot a polar equation, the running variable is actually theta. At every possible angle, there is one or more radii. So what we're going to do is we're going to increase the angle just like the way we increase x. And for every point, put that into the equation and decide how far at that particular angle will the point be from the origin. This actually leads to a very interesting way of plotting the graph. You are actually going around the origin in circles. And of course, when the distance actually varies, you tend to be able to get a very interesting curve. So I've kind of used up my quota for math probably for now and for the next 10 years. So let's jump in to look at the art side of things. Now, imagine a trigonometric function. Oh, I thought I was done with the math. Oh well. A trigonometric function is periodic. What that means is it goes up and then it goes down and then it goes up and then it goes down and so on. So imagine if I plotted a trig function in a polar coordinate system. So you can guess that for certain values of trigonometric functions, what you're going to get is a periodic in and out movement from the origin and that can actually produce some really interesting results. Now, instead of actually, you know, telling you what equations to use, I'm just going to show you a few simple ones and then I'm going to link you to a bunch of resources that will potentially give you even nicer curves. To do this, we use an open source software called GraphCalc. Essentially, it is a graphing calculator that does things in both polar and Cartesian coordinates. So what you want to do when you have GraphCalc loaded up is you actually want to go to the Graph1 tab. Then on the axis, right click and click Equations. The first thing you want to do is to actually switch over to Polar Coordinates. So go ahead and switch over to the Mode tab, then select Polar Coordinates. Then go back to the Equations tab, 
and in there, you will be able to enter basically any polar equation. Instead of using theta, you can use the letter T on your keyboard, and I guess it's kind of hard to type out a math equation, but if you have any experience with this, it shouldn't be too bad. If you're interested to try something right off the bat, go ahead and try sine 7 over 8t. To format this, you can look at the screen, this is how you're going to format it. But before you click OK, we need to actually go to the Range and Precision tab. You see, the reason for that is that the running variable theta was actually written to stop at 2 pi. Most polar equations don't go for very long, but when we actually try to do polar flowers, as these are called, you kind of actually need to let it run for a while. Personally, I can have theta max set up to as high as 100 or 200, depending on the complexity of the equation. If you realize that when you actually try to plot your polar flower, it turns out like this, that means you will probably want to increase your theta max so that it can draw the rest of the flower. So go ahead and set that to maybe 100 and then click OK. Give it a minute to plot and you should see something like this. Now, if this looks really out of shape to you, it's probably cause the axes aren't actually set up properly. If your screen aspect ratio is 16 to 9, that is normal white screen, you can actually copy my X and Y ranges from this screen. If you have a differently sized screen, then the aspect ratio of the plotting area will be different and these values won't work. But you can try tweaking around these values to try to get the image as circular as possible. This particular polar flower should of course look like a perfect circle if you were to actually, you know, trace out the perimeter. Is this the nicest polar flower you can get? Well, the answer is no. There are many very interesting equations that I don't have the time to cover with you. So if you're interested in actually trying out even more equations, do head over to the video description where I will actually have a page for you where people have already plotted a whole bunch of equations. You can then use those equations, you can tweak the coefficients to actually, you know, see different results. There is also another link in the video description where I show someone who's plotted polar equations using a special software and it just makes things look really nice. And that's all we have time for today. I hope this actually gives you a little bit of an insight into math. Not really math, math art. Whatever it is, hopefully this was interesting and not boring. But yeah, that's it. If you have any comments, queries or suggestions, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below. Don't forget to follow my official Twitter channel at twitter.com slash 0612 TV. As always, I appreciate every like, favorite and subscription you give me. But until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. It goes up and then it goes down and then it goes up and then it goes down.